This is Medieval Middle Eastern Ceramics. And this is Mamluk, Egypt and Syria. So, this is a map of the Middle East uh, showing the probably the greatest extent of the Mamluk Empire, this contemporary Ilkhanids. Um, we're actually going to cover a bit of how this got to look like this. So events started with the Seventh Crusade in about 1249, and they uh, attacked Egypt, uh, besieging Damietta, and uh, the leaders of uh, the defense of Egypt against the Crusaders uh, were troops recruited from the steppes known as Mamluks. Um, one of the foremost of these was a, was a chap called Baybars. Um, and so these people fought hard to drive off the Crusaders and it coincided with in fact problems with the Ayyubids. You might remember Salah ad the first uh, Ayyubid Sultan of Egypt and Syria, and uh, the last Ayyubid uh, Sultan of Egypt dies in 1250, and he is replaced by uh, one of these Mamluks, a chap called Qutuz. And you know, we often call it a dynasty, but it's, they are, are not typically um, sort of the same family. They are just uh, soldiers, warriors who are purchased as youth from the steppes and are slaves, but very influential and powerful slaves. And in fact, uh, they can end up running the country. So at this time, really after 1255, is when we have the Okhanids coming into Iran, the, the Mongols that developed a, a, uh, a nation state in, in the area of present day Iran. The leader was Hulagu, and we covered some of that in the last lecture about Iran. So the Mongols come in and establish a political entity here and then they go forward and sack Baghdad killing uh, the last uh, Abbasid Khalif although a member of, some members of the family do escape and become Khalifs in Mamluk Egypt but the, the uh, Mongols do not stop there and they carry on and invade Syria sacking Aleppo and Hama, Damascus, lots of other places, destroying Raqqa. Remember Raqqa, the important pottery production center about here? That was completely destroyed by the Mongols, and there was never a town there until actually recent times again. Um, but then, at the Battle of Ain Jalut, the Okhanid Mongols were defeated by these Mamluks. And so this was the first... Um, major success of the the, the Mamluk uh, Sultanate was the Battle of Ain Jalut. <clears throat> now the uh, the Mongols were not at their full force at this time. Uh, a lot of them had uh, gone back to uh, the, the to the home base back in Mongolia, um, but uh, it was a defeat, and it meant that uh, Syria was taken back under, or Western Syria was taken back under. Uh, ruled from Egypt, and so this area became one political entity, including the holy places. Now, this was actually uh, quite a dangerous time for the Islamic religion, because they were always having trouble in this time with the Crusaders, and they're not actually on this map, but, you know, they're still here. Uh, Jerusalem had been lost, but still there's Antioch and Tripoli, and parts of the Kingdom of Jerusalem along the coast, and the Crusaders allied themselves with the Mongols. And unlike the Seljuks that came into the, this area as Muslims, the Mongols were not Muslims. Uh, they had no interest in Islam at that time, um, and it could have been a big problem if the Crusaders and the Mongols had united together to defeat uh, 
the, the Mamluks. And then if the Mongols decided to be something other than Muslims, it could have been a problem. But um, that's not what happened. And eventually the Okhanids became Muslims as well. So a bit about the Mamluks themselves, 1250 to 1517. So the word mam Mamluk uh, literally means owned. And so it's a word for a slave. And so these warriors, horse warriors, were actually bought uh, on the steppes. Uh, there are two main uh, periods of the Mamluk Sultanate. There are groups known as the Bahri Mamluks, and these are Turks, Kipchak Turks from the Eurasian steppes. And they're often called Bahri Mamluks, named after their barracks on an island in the Nile. And then there's the Burji Mamluks, who are Caucasian Circassians. Uh, so they're recruited from a different group, and they are named al -Burgi, Burgi Mamluks, because they live in the citadel, uh, which is called al -Burj, the tower. So this carries on until 1517, when they're con conquered by the Turks. So this is a, a little bit about this chap. Baybars, he becomes sultan. So as I said, he was uh, partook at least, certainly recorded as being active in uh, fighting the crusaders at Damietta and in Ain Jalut. Then right after Ain Jalut, he becomes sultan. He then proceeds to uh, strengthen the eastern border and also destroy the Crusader uh, Principality of Antioch. And so that's it for one of the Crusader Kingdoms. Um, and then he starts thinking of taking on Tripoli, which is here, you know, the county of Tripoli, another Crusader state. And uh, this creates uh, or initiates the Eighth Crusade, which comes here, uh, and then the Ninth Crusade, uh, the Ninth Crusade is, is here, and it involves uh, fighting crusaders here, but also Mongols around here, because, as I was saying, they tended to uh, be in alliance against the Mamluks. But he fights everybody off, and uh, one of the things he then does is uh, takes one of the most impressive castles in uh, Syria, Crack the Chevalier, or Khalid al Husn, as it's known lately, uh, late, uh, locally, uh, the citadel of the fortress. So this is Craig Chevalier or Khaled al Hissan, and this is a beautiful castle, it's one of my favourites. And you can see it's with this glacy, it's developed to resist attack by trebuchets, the big siege engines that throw rocks at, 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 at you. However, um, when this was a crusader fortress, the wall here was sort of like the wall here, um, quite flimsy with little towers like this. And so when uh, Baybars came along, he set up big uh, trebuchets here and th threw balls, uh, stone balls at the fortress and knocked the, all of the wall down here. And uh, basically, so the outer defenses were completely destroyed. And so Baybars then had all of this rebuilt and had platforms put on them. So these are big towers with platforms on them. So you can put trebuchets on them and shoot back if someone tries to besiege you from this side. So that makes it a, a far more defensible position. And this is the symbol of Baybars. His name means uh, basically Leopard Lord. Um, and you often see this. This is actually at Crack de Chevalier. Uh, with an inscription saying he he rebuilt parts of it. And here's some more. This is the Lion Gate at Jerusalem. And here you can see these lions are a symbol of Baybars. So quite the chap. Um, not especially nice, but uh, got the job done, I guess. So <clears throat> the, the Mamluks are, are very interesting. We get a lot of treatises texts written at this time, sometimes illustrated, 
um, explaining how to do warfare. And so a lot of our understanding of how warfare is done by uh, Turkish forces or the forces of Islam uh, is based on our understanding of, of these treatises. And they also had archery treatises at this time. So it was uh, quite interesting. And here, here's another one. You can see all these uh, chaps running around on, on horses. This is another interesting thing they did. This is uh, an emblem. The Mamluks seem to, to like emblems. And uh, these often show up on their art. Uh, they could be, uh, this is a kind of cup and some horns and another cup. Uh, so they're usually round, they're not always. And you find them on all sorts of objects. This is obviously a piece of textile. But you also find them on pottery, so it's interesting to understand what they are. And I've thrown some other materials in here because we have been talking about forms to do with other other vessels of other materials. This is uh, known as the Baptistery of St. Louis um, and is actually a big basin uh, made in Egypt or Syria, made of, of, of brass with silver inlay. Very nice. And this is... Uh, made for the Mamluk Sultan al-Nasir between about 13 and 1341. A lot of calligraphy. You see, you'll, you'll notice a lot of calligraphy on this stuff. And this doesn't have calligraphy, but it's uh, an interesting shape. This is a candlestick. And here's a, another nice vessel with, again, lots of calligraphy and roundels and things. And glass. There's a lot of glass. A lot of enameled glass. Here you can see another one of those blazons here, an emblem. Um, you also get this made out of pottery, because don't forget it's, it's beautiful glass, but the lamp is actually at the top, so the light radiates from the top. Here's another beautiful one, again with a, an emblem up here, and an enamel painted, and calligraphy. Very typical Mamluk stuff, and also very typical calligraphy, and here another emblem of <clears throat> an important official in the administration, uh, the the uh, someone who carries the sultan's bow. So that means you're you're very important. And here's another. This is belongs to the person that is the cup holder for the sultan. So again, a very important appointment, and lots of calligraphy. Also, little bottles. And here's another one, again, with lots of Mamluks being depicted on here. So, <clears throat> pottery. So, we have two major production centers for stone paste bodied wares. Damascus and Fustat. Uh, don't forget, Raqqa here would have been completely destroyed. Um, so, um, presumably any other center that might have existed along the Euphrates because this became the border. So <clears throat> Damascus seems to be the only production center. It's the only place we have evidence for in this part of the world of stone paste. And we only find, because there's wasters found at Damascus, and there is um, only one fabric in, in pottery from around in Syria, which is presumably therefore what Damascus looks like. Um, and of course we have it going back into Ayyubid times. Fustat also continues production. Um, pottery tends to be more local there. The, the fabrics for both of them include sand, um, as it had been in the Ayyubid and Fatimid periods, um, in Egypt anyway. Uh, the sand is distinct from each other, thankfully. Um, the uh, If you can see, see, here's the sand grain, you see. And of course this will be crushed. And you can see even where it's crushed, you can see traces of, of the curved parts of a sand grain. <clears throat> but the, uh, the Fustat quartz is a lot uh, more cloudy. See, these, f these are called fluid inclusions. You see, there's very few fluid inclusions in most of this quartz, so this would suggest or indicate this is the Damascus fabric. 
if this was the Fustat fabric, there'd be a lot more of these fluid inclusions. And so it would be quite distinct. Also, the sand grains seem to be typically, um, statistically speaking, larger. So, so that it is possible to distinguish between them. So luster wares exist. Uh, there's not a lot of them. Um, typically, they will have a blue glaze or turquoise glaze and this rich brown luster paint. Uh, the, the motifs will include a lot of calligraphy, but also things like these birds, the, the, f the frondiness going in the background is quite typical. The, the birds look like they're derived from East Asian cranes. Um, and it's, it's a time like this you, you have to realize there are motifs that are influential, which do not come necessarily from other pieces of pottery. This might actually be from a piece of silk from China or something with uh, cranes on it or something or birds on it, which has influenced um, this object. And here's another one. This is a, a form known as an alberello, um, which is basically Italian for something which is like a barrel, alberello. But this is a, a typical um, storage vessel in the Middle East. I showed you some Fatimid ones that I found in Corinth, which were very nice. But this is uh, the later ones from the Mamluk period. And, uh, and they're very nice and shiny. This one's at the British Museum. And there are <clears throat> other wares. Like, this is an interesting type. I've never been able to thin section this or analyze this group. Uh, I'm sure this is made in, in Damascus because it's kind of attractive. Typically the ones made in Egypt are not as attractive. But I'll get to that. It seems to have an overall slip which is grey. I don't know why it's grey. You can see <coughs> that there are grey bits here behind the white bits. So I'll have this grey slip which covers the entire vessel. Why it's grey I don't know because as I say I haven't analysed any. I've only found, I only have seen whole objects like this. Um, it could be something very simple. I don't know. But then it's painted with white stone paste slip paint. So this is like white, very white stone paste paint on the outside. And then it has uh, underglazed paint, chromium black, uh, and then glazed. And so then you get this quite impressive looking vessel. And of course you have underglazed painted wares. So the earlier wares, um, so we're, we're looking at after 1250 now, um, but early in the Mamluk period, there's a lot of uh, similarities with late Ayyubid pottery, like in these motifs around here, and also a lot of calligraphy. They did love their calligraphy. Doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, quite often it's, it's, it's gobbledygook, but, but it was a, a nice thing to have. And here's another one, Victoria Albert Museum. So standard stone paste body, uh, underglazed painted blue and chromium black, cobalt blue, and an alkali glaze. And here's another alberello. Uh, this is related to that grey bodied, grey slipped group, only it's all still white. And this, I have no idea what this is, could be an inkwell or something. And Again, lots of geometric patterns, um, very respectable, more geometric patterns. But again, you know, we find fragments of these in excavations at Fustat and Damascus and elsewhere. And this, this is, uh, these tiles are often thought to be made between about 1400 and 1450 because of quite a famous tomb in Damascus of that date. Um, but they actually have a number of periods, it appears to me. Um, this actually looks like it would have been made before 1400. You can see a lot of these motifs are quite closely related to the ways luster wares were being decorated earlier on. This is an interesting underglaze painted piece. It has another one of these uh, blazons on, one of these uh, emblems, and this is the sword bearer's uh, emblem. Again, an important position. 
So, <clears throat> what I want to come to now is China. So Yi Liang's going to sit up and pay a lot of attention to this. Um, so we have seen pottery coming to the Middle East from China uh, for some time now. Uh, there was a lot coming in the Tang Dynasty. Oh, no, we have a gap between the Tang and the Dynasty here. This is the Tang Dynasty. As if you remember, the Tang were very much into the Silk Road. And so there's a, like a lot of connections going on here and a lot of trade and a lot of the pottery going west and some pottery going east, a lot of glass going east, of course, because the in China they didn't have the glass blowing. And so there are like glass uh, sites all the way along the coast along here where vast amounts of glass are exported from the Middle East to China. Um, and so there's a lot stuff going backwards and forwards but we're mostly talking about pottery and we know a lot of pottery came west and certainly enough to influence the local production and I've shown you things that look like this and this from Samara and Sirath we have things like this from Sirath so <clears throat> Chinese pottery as a whole tend to be very highly fired <clears throat> Um, porcelainous quite often or far to stoneware temperatures um, and typically quite restrained in its decoration it is it's, it's more about being beautiful than being colorful and it also has a different type of glaze so if you remember we have in the Middle East the alkali glaze with soda and potash in it these are the fluxes with uh, a lead glaze, where the lead is the flux. We have the hybrid lead alkali glaze with both of them. And we have a tin glaze, which is not, which is actually talking about the opacifier. And this will in fact be a hybrid lead alkali glaze with tin in it. But in China, we have a lime glaze. And so calcium oxide is the flux. And so this is a high temperature glaze. So <clears throat> these uh, these porcelainous wares, and early porcelainous, became a lot more common in the Song Dynasty, and they made a lot of very beautiful carved um, pottery. Some of it actually also came to the Middle East, but not so much. Um, and they started making uh, this sort of celadon, as we often call it, this, this iron fired under reducing conditions look. And early uh, Longquan uh, vessels like this. But that was before these people came along. This is Genghis Khan. And so you remember Genghis Khan, he came and he knocked down a lot of cities in the Middle East and caused a lot of unrest. Well, he, he made the Chinese unhappy too, but not quite as much as um, his successors did. So here we have the homeland of Genghis and the expansion and the expansion under his successors, including China. And this is the guy that expanded to China. This is Kublai Khan, um, ruled from 1260 to 1294. And became known as the emperor of the Yuan dynasty uh, from 1271. So the thing about the Mongols is, um, they, well, they created a, quite a large empire. So this is the Yuan dynasty. It's so big, it's almost off the map. Here's some, actually here's Jing De Zhen, where a lot of the pottery I'm about to talk about is made. Long Quan is here, and there's other important pottery production centers around. Um, the Mongols are very colorful. They like very colorful things, particularly blue. See, very blue and, and blue. They like blue. Um, blue like the sky. They're very keen on the sky. If you ever listen to Mongol music, they, they often have songs about the sky because there's a lot of sky on the steppes. And the thing about the Mongols is when they're running things, You really want to do what they tell you to do. 
because they can be quite nasty at times. And so if they say, hey, you know that pottery they make in the Middle East, that nice colourful stuff with lots of paint on it? Would you make some of that for us? And so instead of you saying, ah, but we only make beautiful and elegant pottery here, what you do is say, yes, of course we will. And so they made blue and white pottery. They didn't seem to know how to make the black painted wares, but they certainly worked out how to make the cobalt blue painted wares. Um, the, the earliest dated blue and white we have is from 1351. Um, and this is very nice, very well done. Um, so it's possible that they were messing around with this a lot earlier in the Yuan period. In fact, this is getting towards the end of the Yuan period. Uh, they would be done in 1368. So this is mostly in China at Jingdezhen made probably before 1351. This isn't like the first one. This is just possibly towards the end of production. Here is a nice one. Um, one of the things of interest here are these really weird motifs. And it is at fact suggested that this is trying to replicate uh, calligraphy, Arabic calligraphy. Because um, you can see they, they've generally trying to do the same sort of floral designs they would have carved into the ceramics in earlier periods and and worked other things out. I don't know what they were doing with this. It's often called the wave and rock uh, motif. Um, but this really looks like somebody been copying Arabic calligraphy. That's thought to be that's where this is from and that they were in fact copying underglazed painted wares from the Middle East. That seems to be the received wisdom and seems quite amusing to me, of course. Here's another one. You see, much in keeping with the same aesthetic as we were seeing in the earlier pottery made in China, but blue and white. And here we have again that, that motif that's possibly derived from uh, calligraphy. So, we do get this in the Middle East, of course. Oh, here's another one. That's a nice one. That sort of wave and rock pattern again. We do get this in the Middle East. Um, and so what is interesting in that case is when do we get these things in the Middle East? And someone who's important about that is this chap. This chap is called Timur. And he came out of Samarkand and basically created an empire, the Timurid Empire. And we have an entire lecture about him and the pottery made in his empire. And uh, he came down into Syria and he killed a lot of people and sacked a lot of cities and broke a lot of pottery. So there are a couple of interesting and important cities. One is Aleppo here and another is Hama here. Both were destroyed and had their pottery broken by Timur and his friends. This is pottery excavated at Hama and reported in the excavation. So this is what that pot looked like now. And if you look at this and forget that's kind of brown and yucky looking, this really looks a lot like the prototypes made in China, made at Jingdezhen. The, the motifs are very close copies in many cases of things that were made in China. And this is this piece of pottery was broken in 1402. So, of course, it's possible to, that it's, it's a hundred year old piece of pottery broken in 1402. But it's more likely that it was that it was made shortly before 1402. And that would mean that's made sometime after 1351, which is when those two beautiful vases at the British Museum um, were made. And so it is it is possible that what happened was once they started making the blue and white um, and then the Mongols ended in 1368, maybe they then thought, let's sell this stuff to those people in the Middle East because we have to send them something so that we can get more of their glass. And so it is conceivable that 
all this blue and white that we have in the Middle East, and we have a lot of Yuan blue and white in the Middle East, and um, there are large collections in, in museums that date back to medieval times, um, that this was like, okay, we don't want this stuff anymore. Let's send it all off to the Middle East. And so it really looks like it was near the end of the 14th century, the 1300s, that they had enough of this blue and white from China to influence local production. But you can see it is a, a, a big influence. They're basically trying to copy the imported blue and white and um, make exactly the same thing. So this is Aleppo. I actually spent a number of seasons excavating at this site. Um, it's pretty impressive. And this is what it looks like from above. It's like this big fortress. This is the medieval city on this side. This is the later medieval city on this side. Um, so this was taken by the Mongols, in fact. Um, the Mongols just climbed right up the side. And then it was taken later in 1402 by Timur and his friends. Mostly his friends. I'm sure he sat down here and had some tea or something. But um, they came up here and, of course, they knocked the buildings over and broke the pottery. And there was some earlier pottery. This is uh, the sort of geometric thing that would have been made before we had the Yuan influence. And there were slip painted things like this, which were contemporary. But then with the destruction levels, we have things like this. And again, you can see this is very closely copying prototypes that were made in China at Xingdezhen. And so that this was broken in 1402 and it was clearly broken in 1402, um, that this would have not been made significantly before then. And one thing we know from looking at later pottery is that these styles change through time. There isn't like a gener more than a generation between seeing the prototypes and making this pottery. So it's likely that the uh, blue and white came to the Middle East possibly even after the Yuan dynasty ended. So this is uh, some nicer looking uh, local Damascus products. Uh, again, with copying quite closely those uh, Chinese motifs. Uh, this is a bit more evolved from that. Um, it says Syria or Persia because this could actually be an early Persian um, piece from the 15th century. As could, in fact, this be. I mean, I'm putting things in. Oh, this is Mamluk. Right? Yeah, that's that's what the dealers say it is, but it could actually be from Iran. This, however, is definitely Mamluk. Uh, this is a piece made in Fustat, and it is very nice, um, but somehow the, the ones from Damascus are nicer. Uh, but I've thin sectioned this one, and it's from Fustat. So uh, there are these tiles, again, so the, the blue and white ones, uh, entirely blue and white ones, will be more typically, definitely of this early 15th century date, um, even though they're often geometric. Um, but they have a lot of that influence from the Chinese objects. Um, and we have Alborella carrying on. Um, this one is still has some chromium black paint in this calligraphy, but a lot of the other motifs are clearly indicating the influence from Yuan. Uh, this is the same piece, you see, this is sold in Sotheby's and bought by the Aga Khan Museum. Isn't that nice? And again here, these motifs, um, this is actually, it looks like a, a European shield uh, emblem, but it's actually Mamluk. But all of these motifs are derived from Yuan, blue and white. <clears throat> and this is another one. It's not the same one, is it? Do I keep doing that? No, it's a different one. Here we go. And then we come to slip and size wares, which also become very popular in this time. This one is found near Aleppo. And I've uh, looked at a lot of uh, this type of pottery at Aleppo when I was working there. Um, and is of this date. And in Egypt, um, in Cairo, we have a lot of pottery like this. And I'm showing you this one. 
because this is such a nice bunny. This is slip painted. No, it's not slip painted. It's actually just covered with slip and then incised. And then they sort of excised away some of the slip to show the bunny. I think that's quite nice, really. And of course, it's the year of the rabbit. So there you go. I should tweet that or something, shouldn't I? Again, a lot of calligraphy, you see. It was very big on that. So this, again, has an overall slip. And then it is slip painted and then incised and then covered with a lead glaze. So there are, again, these, these emblems or blazons are very popular. And this is the emblem of the cup bearer, as I said. See the cup here? This one's actually at the ROM. This is the hockey sticks, or polo sticks, actually. I like to call them the hockey sticks for Canadian content. Um, this is, again, a very important person, uh, someone that carries the Sultan's polo sticks. This is um, possibly a member of the Royal Orchestra's emblem. And he toots a horn for the Sultan. And this is supposed to be the emblem of the taster. I don't know what this round thing is. Maybe that's a plate uh, on a napkin, maybe. And here's a very nice uh, emblem. This is, again, the lion uh, of Baybars, possibly. It certainly looks like it. Although I don't think this is for him, because I'm sure he would want something nicer. And that, of course, brings us to the world's most important archaeological site. Or it was when I used to go there. This is Dir Mar Musa al-Habashi in Syria, uh, the monastery of St. Moses the Abyssinian. And there was a lot of pottery. I went there just for a trip when I was excavating another site. And uh, I, I went into this uh, monastery and they had a little museum there. And it's filled with Mamluk pottery. Very nice. Uh, it's almost all Mamluk. It's like the place wasn't occupied at any other time other than in the Mamluk period. Um, but you can see here there's uh, underglazed painted wares that are clearly before Yuan influenced and ones which are Yuan influenced. And also there's turquoise and black here as well, which is another thing. But I don't seem to mention that before. But yes, they, they made that as well. But it's not as popular or as nice as the blue and white. So there you go. And they had even more um, earthenwares, clay earthenware bodies. And this one is slit painted and it creates these petally things. And this is a drawing of it. So the form of this is again derived from earlier Yuan Celadons. And this is where it's useful looking at our well-dated sequence of pottery from Iran. And of course, you remember why it is well-dated. It's because they put dates on it, which is very nice. And you kind of wish they did that more often. But so the, the period in which uh, ceramic forms are dominated by these sort of things is coming in with group 9, 1285 to 1310. So that's probably the, the date of that pottery from Dir Marmuza. They also have a lot of these other wares with large areas excised away, um, sort of like slip incised, and it has a very nice earthenware body again, and here's the slip made of stone paste, and this is the lead glaze. And the fabric um, has a lot of large rounded grains of quartz in it. Um, I don't have any evidence of where this is from, but I think that kind of makes me think Damascus. And it's the most likely production center. And they actually have quite a lot of this pottery I found uh, at the Damascus Sidula excavations when I visited them. So it's probably made in Damascus. And as you see, there's an awful lot of it. Most of the pottery is of exactly the style in this period. And it's quite a nice uh, vessel. Um, would have looked like this, you see. There's another flowery shaped one. One with these uh, radiating things and stars and things. So, hang on, let me go back to that. So, uh, it's quite interesting. There's so much pottery on this site of one period. 
even though the site was founded in the 15th, the 5th century, that's the 5th century AD, and continued in, in occupation until the 19th century, until it was abandoned for a while and then refounded in the 1980s. And, but all the pottery is of this one period. It's very odd. Now it's found in the restoration of the monastery. It's found in the caves where the monks often lived. Um, so it's, it is quite interesting. And the only clue as to why it would be, I mean, at first I thought this must be when the site was abandoned and they broke all the pottery. But we do have lots of evidence for later occupation. And so that can't be it. But I saw an inscription in the monastery saying that the Patriarch of Jerusalem, which is for the Eastern Orthodox uh, people of the monastery, uh, would be like the Pope was visiting. And so now it's um, the Syrian Catholic Church, which are Catholics, but Syrians, and um, so it's, it's basically Catholics who used to be Syrian Orthodox but became Catholics. And so the Pope is basically in charge. And so I, I asked the, um, I was talking to the, uh, the head of the monastery and I said, what would happen if the Pope came? And he said, I would go out and buy new pottery. So this is what I think this is about basically because the Patriarch of Jerusalem was coming exactly the time when this pottery was made, they went down to Damascus, bought a lot of pottery, and that was the most of the pottery for the, the monastery until it all broke. So the Mamluks carried on. Theirs is the period of the Black Death. And so Cairo was struck 50 times during Mamluk, the Mamluk period. It's a nice dramatic illustration of the Black Death. People just dying in the street. Not very nice. Also, Vasco da Gama didn't help. Of course, this is uh, the beginnings of Europeans taking the long route and cutting out the middleman. Um, a lot of wealth went through Cairo at this time. And, of course, they were conquered by the Ottomans, who basically conquered all of this area. And so that was it for the Mamluk dynasty, or Sultanate. Thank you.